to the Peter Billy experience number three and tonight we're going to be talking about the Hung On You booty which I've promised for the last two shows and as you can see I've got a new addition to the show. Hello there. And this is Craig Smith, a dear friend and also part of the Perfume Garden Collective. Mm -hmm. So tell, tell us a bit about yourself, Craig. Well, we met Pete and Susie a few years ago. Um, I was a graphic designer for quite a long time and um, got involved with Perfume Garden, didn't we? When we've organised a couple of events over the last couple of years and we've got another one coming up soon. But um, I was a graphic designer for some, some years and I'm also a bit of an artist. So I do a lot of the poster artwork for Perfume Garden as well as a lot of the cover art for my mixes on Mixcloud, which is online. So yeah, that's where I'm coming from. And also Craig will be good when it comes to talking about specific boutiques, as he will be the person that will give me the probing questions rather than me just talking to the camera. I can, I can kind of talk to Craig Yes, I find that the dialogue between the two of us might be easier on the eye. Well, easier on your eye anyway, maybe not mine. Okay, before we proceed with the Hung On You part of the show, I received some important information regarding show two and Peter Daltrey's kaftan. I was informed that the actual designers of the kaftan were two people called Peter Such and Paul Reeves. Paul Reeves I've actually got in contact with and I'm hoping to do an interview with in the, in the coming weeks. So as I get the information I will pass it on to the show. And incredibly of all the people that wore the kaftan, we forgot to show some pictures of Jimi Hendrix wearing the incredible kaftan as worn by Pete Stoltry of Kaleidoscope. <laughs> So now we're going to talk about the legendary boutique Hung On You. We've decided that it'd be better if Craig compiles some questions and then just fires them at me and then I hopefully can answer them. Mm. And if there are any mistakes in my answers or people think there's stuff that I've omitted, add them on the comments below and, and then I'll carry on with the next show and hopefully rectify my mistakes if there are any. So Peter, Hung On You was run and owned by Michael Rainey. Um, tell me more about his background. Well, Michael Rainey had a very interesting background. Michael Rainey's mother was a very famous socialite in the 50s and 60s called Marion Rottersley. His, his um, father, Sean Rainey, and his mother split up at a very early age. When Marion remarried, they had houses in Chelsea and also in Spain. So in Michael's formative years, he hopped between Spain and London. Mm -hmm. Michael himself didn't have, actually have any formative training in the fashion world or the arts. Mm -hmm. It was more to do with the people that he hung around with in Chelsea. So how did he come to run the boutique, Peter? Michael was well known around the Chelsea area as a, as a snappy dresser. married to Jane Ormsley Gore, mm -hmm. who was also uh, a very famous socialite and her yes. father was Rod Harlick, who I think also ha helped payroll the running of the boutique. Right, I see. Jane, well, herself, <laughs> Jane herself worked for the Vogue magazine, which mm -hmm. helped mm -hmm. with um, getting exposure for the, for the boutique. Mm -hmm. So when I see pictures of Michael Rainey, he's very much a very handsome chap and very much a clothes horse for his clothes. Well exactly, he was like almost like the perfect model. Mm -hmm. You can't get anything better than that. The actual person that manages, runs the shop and he's the ultimate model for the clothing Absolutely. himself. Absolutely, that works best. Doesn't There's it? some fantastic footage mm -hmm. of him on Pathé where he's actually swinging on one of his shadow stripe jackets himself. Yeah. And there's also some um, black and white footage of Michael, you know, going into work and mm -hmm. it's nice footage of him leaving his house, mm. saying goodbye to his wife, Jane. Goodbye, Jane. Yeah, exactly. Finally, infiltrating into Westminster, the land of division bells and Tory MPs, the family man of the foursome, and incidentally the most way out, Michael Suffern. Rainey. Go on, Saffron. Got to get up now. I called my baby Saffron because materialism has taken over Christianity 
Therefore, I don't think that Christian names like Michael, David, John, and so forth are really part of 1967 any longer. I met Jane five years ago, and that's when most things started happening in my life. We've now been married seven months. We moved into this house the day that the baby was born. It was a very strange coincidence because it was as though now that there was a house, there was a house for baby to be in. I mean, that's one of the reasons why it's all rather disorganized. The extraordinary thing is that my father, who's been in the army all his life practically, five years ago, more or less ordered me to go and have my hair cut. And um, he's begun to come round to thinking about it in a completely different way. Not so much just the fact that, oh no, you can grow your hair long, but by feeling that we should be allowed to have our freedom. Curious that the length of hair has become more a point of principle than a mere matter of taste. Obviously, with him having some money and knowing some influential people, including Christopher Gibbs, who was a antiques dealer. Mm. And what was happening with the explosion in the fashion, mm. he decided for, to do something himself to, to open a, a boutique, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Hung on you meaning both we sell clothes and we love you, which is good shopkeeping in any language. And the lollipop says what the toy car said. It's all another tiny colored womb, warm and gentle, in its way an escape from the H-bomb, television, and other horrors of the workaday world. And there's, you know, it's had a couple of locations, as I understand it. Uh, with regards to the first location, um, you know, was it a handful of similar boutiques in the area? Well, he, he started off at a location just off the King's Road called 22 Kale Street. Ah. And he eventually moved to the King's Road. Mm -hmm. But the actual Kale Street location opened in the winter of 1965. Mm. I And when he started off, it was quite similar to how Granny Takes a Trip started. He was basically getting a lot of vintage clothing and rejigging it, like D mob suits and military jackets, mm. and um, re having them retailored. It's important to mention at this point that he wasn't actually doing the design himself. He had the ideas and then he, he would have this work done by East End tailors. That's One amazing. of the That's tailors amazing. that he had involved as things started to progress was a gentleman called Cliff Foster. Right. And his father was a top tailor who actually was um, well known for making the Regency jackets, mm. which became very famous mm. Mm. with shops like Hong Kong New Dandy Fashions mm. and Granny takes a trip. Well, very famous shops that we know of, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Well, um, my next question, I suppose, is why did he move locations in the first place? He had his first shop, didn't he? Uh, and his second shop was a different location. Maybe you could tell us more about uh, maybe about that, please. Well, um, when he when he was at the Kale Street, it immediately started to explode. Mm -hmm. It didn't take long for for the word spread around London about this boutique, and mm -hmm. before. Before I knew it, he was having people like The Who, wow. The Beatles, The Rolling Stones, all buying their mm -hmm. clothing from there. Yeah, yeah. And it's also important to uh, mention at this point also that when when this when he actually opened the boutique in Kale Street, it was like in total opposition to what had gone before in Carnaby Street. Right. It's like he was catering for a totally different clientele. Mm -hmm. the, the clientele that he was dealing for within the Chelsea area were a more affluent 
person who had money, uh, yeah. had a lot more money to spend. Mm -hmm. These people were definitely a lot more adventurous to mm -hmm. the, the kind of the more mod mm -hmm. kind of clientele that were buying clothing at the Carnaby Street right. booty. I know the shop had a very striking mural as well by Michael English. Would you like to tell us more about uh, the mural and the artwork? Well, the actual mural itself yeah. was commissioned by a guy called Anthony Little. Mm. And basically, he did the actual the, the painting on the front of the Kale Street window as well. Right. And he did he did one of the walls in a mural, which was also which was all influenced by the Art Nouveau movement, mm -hmm. which also coincided with an Aubrey Beardsley exhibition uh -huh. that opened at the V&A in 1966. When you actually walked into the the Kale Street shop, there would have been a chaise long on the window. And as you walked into the main room, it was all painted in purple. Mm. And you had one wall where there was the wow. where there was the um, mural that was painted in the style of Aubrey Beardsley. I've just pictured this now. Yes. And as you walked to the to the end, there was a kind of there was some stairs that led downstairs with the, where they had the clothing. Mm -hmm. And I always like to think that with the, with the Hung On You boutique, it was revolutionary in the, in the sense that you had your Carnaby Street shops, which were loaded with clothes, which was fantastic. Mm. But this was a totally different. This was more like an art, an art exhibition, a gallery. Yes. Yeah, so there was only there was only limited amounts of clothes. So people were kind of wearing art, I suppose. In that, in that exactly, way. and that is, I think that's what what the difference is. Wow. So you've mentioned some of the uh, people who visited the store, like uh, members of the Beatles and uh, such like. Um, are there any stories you know of uh, anything that happened with some of these characters who came in and uh, wore the clothes? And... I was told by a very good source that that went into the shop that Michael and some of his friends would often be just hanging around on the chaise lounge in the window really? almost, almost like in their in their in their club in, in their in their in their finery in their velvets <laughs> and silks smoking smoking uh, marijuana and and quite oblivious really to people coming into the shop not the, not the Mary Jane surely not well um, and probably some of other things as well maybe allegedly <laughs> so Pete what kind of clothing were home on you actually selling well they a whole array of fabrics um, from mm. velvet, satins, mm. silks. Um, Michael Rainey was kind of known as the first person that was actually using flowery motif prints from Liberties in right. his shirts, Very which good. then became more famous when Granny's opened uh -huh. okay. a few months later. Mm. One of their famous um, garments were the the velvet shadow stripe jackets, ah, which yes. were worn by so many of the um, pop stars of the day, including George Harrison, mm. Brian Jones, Jimi Hendrix. Talking to Jimi Hendrix, he was a very, very famous patron of Hung On You. Mm. And we went to, a couple of years ago, when they opened the Handel ex um, exhibition stroke place where Jimi Hendrix lived. Yeah. When you actually go up the stairs to his actual, his pad, there's a glass mirrored Hung On You shadow stripe jacket that Jimi wore and apparently he'd left it at one of the venues where he was playing. Right. Fantastic. You mentioned the mirrors. Did he have a mirrored ceiling by any chance as well in this part? I, well, I, I don't know about that one. You didn't check that out? No, no, oh, no, 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 no. Okay, fantastic. Well, I've definitely seen pictures of the Rolling Stones in Hung On You. Maybe you could tell me more about what they got up to. They were all aficionados of Hung On You, especially Brian Jones and Mick Jagger.
pictures actually of Mick Jagger um, picking out and, and uh, purchasing. It, it seemed like a, a Nauru mandarin collared jacket wow. with yeah. little mirrors and he actually wore it on stage at the London Palladium and throughout the the final European tour in 67. Fantastic, yeah. Take it or leave it. Don't tell your friend just what you Brian Jones wore many of their garments as well, mm. as did the Beatles mm. yeah. and the Who. So they were regular customers at home. They were all, yeah, they were all regular customers, and obviously and the, they had the cash to exactly because that that's an important mm. um, factor as well. Um, you were you were paying something like thirty five guineas for a jacket suit, mm. which I don't know what, what the equivalent is to mm. today's money, but it would have been very expensive, quite considerable. And that's also relevant to where the location was. Mm. The, the people that lived in and around the Chelsea area usually had as more the, money than as they, they do today. Yeah, exactly. Nothing that, that hasn't changed. Michael himself didn't have an aversion to who was making the clothes. He um, he was very open to designers coming in, and if he liked what they actually had, mm -hmm. he didn't he didn't mind actually selling it within his boutique. Right. And he also didn't mind if a customer come in and they wanted some specific um, design, mm -hmm. or they had an idea of of, of a detail they wanted on whether it was a shirt or a jacket. He didn't mind. Actually. He did. He did not following that through right because right? he had his he had his tailors yeah at the east end and obviously he had uh, cliff foster that was making sure so making they, they they had what they wanted really it's not space basically as, as, long, right. as long as it fitted within mm. the remit of what he liked yeah yeah because one of the most important things for him was color right he was very interested in color did he have his favorite colors in his range at all yeah he, he, he um so, someone's, um, I think it's Nick Cohen put in a book that he's uh, the colours that he favoured were almost like ice cream colours. Ah, right. Pistachios, pinks, yeah, yellows. Yes, fantastic. So, Peter, how long did the boutique run for? Like we established, it started in the winter of 1965. By by the spring of 1967, Michael wanted to try his luck and move from. The Kale Street residence to 430 Kings Road, mm. but straight away, when once he moved to Kings Road, he uh, entered some problems. Obviously, the higher rent. Mm. By this time, he was losing some of his tailors some, to some of the competition, mm -hmm. and also him and Jane were starting to wane and lose a bit of interest in the business because a lot of these people they were interested in, in the art side of it. But when it comes right. to the business side, the money, they didn't really have a clue or were not really bothered. That's a shame. Isn't it? Because mm. with Jane's um, background, she had money anyway, so it wasn't really like they were running the business right. to you know to live from. By the, sure, sure. By the summer of 1968, they'd almost given up. Right. And also by that stage, they'd found God as well. So by September of 68. They'd actually, yeah, yeah, they'd given up, hung on you to find God and they went out to... And did they find him? I didn't know he was lost, to be honest. Well, well, maybe he was. Well, I don't know if he found him or not, but... <laughs> so Michael and Jane went off to India and then Tommy Roberts from Kleptomania then took on the lease. Right. And then a new history started within 430 Kings Road. I heard it was called uh, Mr. Freedom. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. What's the background behind that name, and um, you know, do you know why they came up with that name in particular? Or well, I, with regards to Tommy Roberts and Mr. Freedom, I think we'll keep that for another, another show. show. So sadly, yeah. by September of 1968, Hung on You was no more. Really?
That's, a, that's very sad, Pete, but um, these things uh, must continue. And as a collector of uh, many different garments, what kind of pieces do you have from Hung on You? Well, firstly, Hung on You's clothing is so rare and so hard mm -hmm. to come by. Right. So I've only owned two pieces myself. Mm -hmm. I did own a shirt, mm -hmm. which I have now sold on. Right. So this takes us to the only garment they actually do own from Hong Kong U, which I think is a rather special one. It is. Which is the uh, tie that's adorning this shirt. Looks fabulous, Pete. Tell me more. Well, the, the tie itself was like a very important prop within the uh, promo photos that Michael Rayley did for Hong Kong U. Mm -hmm. You can see it on quite a few pictures. There's one famous picture of Michael with his good friend Christopher Gibb, who was a very yeah. famous art dealer yeah. at the time and right. I was and also yeah. the trendsetter when it comes to the men's fashion. Yeah. So there's a picture of Michael Rainey and to the right of them there's a string of ties. Uh -huh. One of which is the tie we see here. Yeah. So this has seen some life then. I mean how many parties has that been worn at? I mean it's time. So Peter, how did you come across such a rare item? Well the uh, story behind this is a few years ago I was doing an article on Dandy Fashions and through this article I got to know Alan Holston who was the manager of, of the boutique and we uh, struck up a relationship mm -hmm. and for one of my birthdays I received a parcel from Alan and when I actually opened up the parcel I dropped this tie and straight away I recognised what it was and the uh, it tie. yeah, it was a tie, obviously, yeah, and the uh, historical significance of the tie itself. Right. Well, tell us more about the historical significance. I mean, where is it? You know, what's it? Who has it been worn by? Sorry. Well, it's only been worn by Alan, mm -hmm. but like I said, he um, Mike Rain used this tie, so he obviously favoured it because he mm -hmm. used it a lot in uh, his promotional photographs. Brilliant. Beautiful tie, isn't it? That has the and the colours and the uh, tell us some more about the, the way it was actually uh, produced because you've got these colours coming from the bottom and you've got these splodges and the, the artwork over it. Well, um, I suppose the uh, the splodges per se uh, are staining from when Alan was wearing it ah. for, for his time. From when oh, I see. It. A little bit of red wine here. But, but the actual the actual art on it itself, it yeah. was. Um, Initially, when I when I did get the tie, sure. I was led to believe that it was uh, Chris Jagger, who was Mick's brother, mm -hmm. had actually painted it because uh, Chris is also known for doing the uh, jackets mm -hmm. that were worn by Eric Clapton, John sure. Lennon, sure. and Jimi Hendrix, the psychedelic, mm. hand painted, hand drawn art on on the jackets, sure. and I thought this was a, an early version of that. But through research, it ended up it was an actual an Irish girl, right, called Julie, who um, was quite handy with the Indian inks, mm. and, and it was her that actually did did the um, artwork and the tie, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, was sold to Michael, mm -hmm. who then yep. got them in the shop and was and sold it to Alan. Brilliant, and Alan's had it uh, for a long time, and then it came over to you. Yeah, yeah which was pretty amazing and so generous to, to do so. So yeah, yeah so I only own one piece of Hong You, but you, know, you can't get much better than that. <laughs> We've now got a close up of the Hong On You tie. As you can see, the uh, drawing is rather primitive. You can see the lead pencil initial markings and the Indian ink colorings. And through time, where it looks like water's got on it, the Indian ink has run in certain places. The actual tie itself is silk in fabric. From the back of the tie you can actually see more where the where the Indian ink has run through and discoloured the actual tie. And there's no actual label that said that it was sold at Hung On You. So you mentioned Alan Holston owned this tie. Wasn't um, John Crittle uh, who worked at Dandy Fashions uh, involved? Well, well, that's a good point actually, because when John Crittle came over from Australia, the first place he worked at was Hong On Lu. Right. Okay. And it's quite interesting because he was 
Cluster's like a hairy ass Australian, <laughs> and right from the start, he just didn't fit in with Michael Rainey and right. his aristocratic I friends. See. There are just juxtaposed two people there. So uh, I, it didn't take long before Michael Rainey had a dislike for John Crittell. But yeah, I think John was with him for about six months, and while John was there, he was also networking mm -hmm. and um, getting to know people, getting to know tailors mm -hmm. and I think that set the seed for him to actually own his own BT, own boutique which was Dandy Fashion right, I see. but that's kind of for another time, for another time <laughs> we can talk about Dandy Fashion yeah. another, another, another famous boutique another that's famous a... boutique we'll talk about in the future sounds great people. but good of you to uh, bring up John Crittle because I think I would have forgotten otherwise on one of your earlier questions when you were talking about famous people that mm. shopped in there mm. well obviously of all the people that shopped in in Holland you the Beatles were the most famous of course, of course. Paul McCartney was a big patron of Hung on You like right through 1967 especially the period when they were making Sgt Pepper right there's okay. loads of pictures of uh, Paul McCartney in different Pete lapelled mm. double breasted jackets oh, and yeah. he actually wore a Hung on You one when they were doing the video for the uh, Beatles were doing their final tour, their world tour, mm. Hong and you were commissioned to make all their stage outfits. Ah, so, all yes. the, so all those stage outfits they were wearing dur during that, that period in I And also the actual clothing that they were wearing when they weren't actually playing on stage. A lot of those garments were also hung on you. You mm -hmm. know when they were doing press conferences in LA, Chicago. Right. The so jackets that were worn by John, George, and Paul. So they went all out to kit the Beatles out for that particular time. Exactly. That they were they were being they were hung on you models for exactly for a large amount of time. Exactly. <laughs> Place, I thought, you know, it was just we were trying to write a children's song. That was the basic idea, and uh, there's nothing more to be read into it than there there is in the lyrics of uh, you know any children's song. Sparky, you know, it's the same kind of thing. Well, I suppose that pretty much wraps up the show for about coming on you. Um, is there anything else coming up in the future you can tell us about? Well. Um yeah, I suppose you're right with wrapping up the Hung On You, but anyone that's watching this, if you have a, if you've got any information that you can add to what I've said, or if I've omitted anything, please put it in the comments below, because like I say, there's not actually much written, recorded information on Hung On You, so everything that I know I've either read or spoken to people that actually shopped in Hung On You, but... I'm always open and always wanting more information on this legendary boutique. We need you. With regard to news, like I said earlier on in the show, mm -hmm. I'm hopefully going to speak to Paul Reeves, who was actually one of the designers involved in the in the caftans that right, similar to the ones that were mm -hmm. 
which was owned by Pete Daltrey. And in a couple of weeks, me and Susie are off down to Chelsea to meet a guy that was actually a designer and actually sold some ties to Hong on you by the name of Lloyd Johnson. Ah, yes. So I'm excited about that. Great stuff. And then you mm -hmm. also go into the uh, Swinging 60s exhibition at the Fashion and Textile Museum right. in Bermondsey. Uh -huh. And hopefully I'll do, we can, we can talk about that in a future show. That would be great to talk about stuff like that. And the V&A, the, the quant, Mary which, quant. Yeah, which is more for the female, but you mm. know, still equally interesting. Sure, more for the female, there we go. More. And also, I've been asked, it's not concrete yet, but I've been asked to do a talk at the, um, the Swinging 60s exhibition. Right. Because while that's going on, there's, a, there's the, uh, the Beat Bespoke happening at the same time, yep. which is like a a 60s celebration of psychedelic garage music where they have live bands yeah show films that sounds fantastic yeah so i've been asked to do a talk about the chelsea set yeah yeah so there's so, plenty going on for well, the next few months yeah yeah thanks for watching and i hope you enjoyed the third installment of the peter feely experience <laughs>